Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Very excited to have Allison Bowden, the CEO of Kink, here today. This is really cool. Um, Allison, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. No, thank you. I actually, I've been stalking you a little bit since last year. Okay. Um, I don't know if you remember, but we met on the red carpet at the TA Awards, for which I was hosting for many vids, which I will be doing again this year. So I'm very excited that they asked me to come back. That's awesome. I'm going to try to do a better job this time. Um, I thought you did a great job. Thank you. It's Red carpet is is tricky. And you know what it is for me, honestly? Um, I'm not as familiar with the transgender porn community as I am with the mainstream just because I work in the mainstream one. And so there were so many people I didn't know. Yeah. And so I didn't know what questions to ask them. But Thankfully, this podcast has really encouraged me to seek out different people oh, that's great. Um, to interview. So I've, you know, had Natalie Mars and Daisy Taylor and Aubrey Kate, um, Buck Angel, who I love. Um, and so, like, I feel like I know more now, so I'll be better this year. So hopefully. Even better. But anyhow, so when I, when I met you, I was really excited because kink.com is a company name that comes up a lot on this podcast because we talk a lot about consent. We talk a lot about boundaries. We talk a lot about ethical porn sets and kink is like the shining example of, of a company that really delivers on all of those things. And this is coming from the performers, you know, it's not, I don't bring you guys up. Um, so when I met you and, you know, learned you were the female CEO of kink.com, I thought, this is a great opportunity to explore this because, yeah. you know, first of all, a lot. one of the things that I'm really trying to do with this podcast is change people's mind about how they see the adult industry, the stigma surrounding it, and also talk to a lot of women about working behind the scenes in the industry because it's an industry that most people imagine is solely male-dominated. And yes, there's a lot of men and disproportionately more men than women, but that's shifting. And so it's always really interesting to me to talk to other women in those positions, um, you know, that are on the cusp of that change. Yeah, there's so many more than you'd think. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess let's start from the beginning. How did you get into working for Kink? Well, um, the short story is that I'd been doing marketing and had seen an ad for Kink hiring an email marketing manager back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, that was my job. I I started doing web development on my own while I was unemployed for a couple of, of years, and I was really ready to do a technical job, but I really wanted to work for Kink. Mm-hmm. Exactly because of the things you just mentioned, mm-hmm. it, the reputation, the fact that it was a porn company with a mission, and my entire career had been an adult prior to that. Yeah, so. I was going to ask you if you had worked an adult. Okay, so that makes yeah, sense. since about tw- two thousand four. Okay, and I was like, well, even if it's just email marketing, I guess I can do some HTML and CSS or something. It'll, right, it'll be interesting. Right, and I, I just fell in love and. After a couple of years, I was like, oh, I'm kind of getting bored with this marketing stuff. I think I'm going to go find another gig mm-hmm. where I can actually use my tech skills. And they were like, no, no, no. Just, you can just come over to the tech team. And they treat not only the performers really well. I just felt really valued as an employee. Mm-hmm. So nine and some change years later, here I am. Yeah, it's um, one of my patron members actually sent me a question <laughs> I mean, he clearly knows a lot about you. Yeah, it was an utterly reasonable question. Yeah, he said, uh, her first five years at Kink, she was in development, building web services. My question, which isn't meant to be sarcastic, how does a marketing professional with a degree in sociology start writing Node.js and MongoDB backend code for a major porn site? That was site? good, you did it. I don't that know what right. any of that shit means. <laughs> But boy, I felt smart saying that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, that's a super reasonable question. Um, so I, like many young women, I was really interested in technology, even as a, a high school kid. Mm-hmm. I was building my own websites when I was 14. Were you using cities. Dreamweaver? No, it was totally by hand. Okay. Hand we used to use everything. Dreamweaver. My sister sent me an email the other day because she wants to redo her husband's like um, uh, bar 
website, which by the way is the airliner downtown in Lincoln Heights. You guys should check it out. It's fucking awesome. But she asked me, she's like, how do people build websites <laughs> these days? She's like, is Dreamweaver still exist? I'm like, no. It totally does, but it's really, really like complicated. Yeah. And it was complicated <laughs> back then. I'm like, Squarespace? Yeah, pretty I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's usually how people do well, it. That was so funny. She's like, Dreamweaver? I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. No, I I uh, just kind of taught myself. Mm-hmm. But I didn't really have the confidence to, like, take the programming classes in, mm-hmm. in high school. They were all boys. And mm-hmm. when I was in college, I was really interested in social issues. Sociology made a lot of sense. I have a women's studies minor. And when I started my first business, I developed a website myself. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it was fairly basic. Mm-hmm. And I, it's a lot easier to get marketing jobs than mm-hmm. it is to be a self-taught coder, especially back then. This right. was before, like, boot camps and, you know, you had to have a CS degree in order to write some basic front-end mm-hmm. stuff. So uh, somewhere around 2009, yeah, no, it was, like, 2008. I got laid off from a job. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to buckle down and take some classes and get my skills up to speed. And I was pretty, you know... I was solid enough in PHP. Mm-hmm. And when I m- moved over to Kink's tech team, that was kind of my role. It was really just like very basic, like changes to the website, like little visual things. And as things went on, I kind of linked up with the right internal people. And when we were ready to rewrite the website, it, it for, your, for your listener, it used to be a Java um, application. A, basically a JBoss monstrosity. And we were like, you know, the kids today are using JavaScript for everything. And I taught myself JavaScript on the job, and we kind of, two of us, built the thing from scratch. Um, MongoDB, no SQL databases, that was a new thing, at least for me. So it was just a lot of self-teaching, mm-hmm. but and people believing in me. Right. So how did that translate to... CEO. So I was a full stack engineer for several years and I f- I'd been at Kink for so long that even when new bosses would get hired, they would need someone to kind of show them the ropes or like understand the internal politics or whatever the case may be. And I became kind of a person who did that. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, had worked for Peter for many years. He knew me. He trusted my opinions. And when we had a VP of technology decide he couldn't do it, he was done. Mm -hmm. They called me up and said, hey, you want this job? And I'm like, not really, but I feel like I, you know, want to help the team and I'll, I'll do that. I can still code, right? And they're like, yeah, of course. I mean, maybe 5% of my time I got to still write code. But I did that for a couple of years, and I guess I did a reasonable enough job that when Peter, the founder of the company, was ready to step down and go pursue life, he asked me to do it. Wow. Yeah. Are you coding at all anymore? No. (laughs) No. Are you sad about that? Really sad, actually. (laughs) Computers are so much simpler than people. (laughs) I was going to say, yeah, there's a big difference. There is. I mean, this is so incredibly rewarding on so many other levels Mm -hmm. that I miss it, Mm -hmm. but I can always go back to coding. That's true. Yeah. What is one of the most challenging things you think about being CEO? I, so like I said, I started around 2004, so I got to witness the more or less destruction of the industry mm-hmm. by the tubes and free content. Mm-hmm. And I think the hardest part is figuring out what's next. Kink was very resilient during that time. I think that it had a, a really unique product mm-hmm. that people wanted. and they Our members are amazing, and they continued to pay for it when other people decided not to. And so right now, I think the biggest challenge is what's the future? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure that for our company, it's mainly recorded content anymore. You know, we're doing e-commerce ourselves. We didn't just farm it out to someone else. We decided to really build that in-house. 
We have a toy line with Doc Johnson that we've collaborated on. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of just looking in new directions because I think that for kink, it's about having a place that being the destination for kinky folks, not necessarily being the destination for kinky porn Mm -hmm. only. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you think that your audience is fundamentally different than the regular porn audience? Because I feel that people, the BDSM community is a, a pretty specific, people with pretty specific tastes. I was in a BDSM relationship for like a year and I learned a lot in that relationship. And I learned that like people are fucking serious about their kink. <laughs> like they're very, and I used to shoot for Taboo for Hustler sure. Magazine and Cynthia Patterson. I don't know if you know her. Mm. Like, so she was the editor and holy shit, I got yelled at so much for doing things wrong. Like I remember I turned in like a sexy set of like a dom and she had like a collar on because I was like, that's kinky. You know what I mean? Like that like looks like overall the stereotype. And she was like, she not a sub, she doesn't wear a collar. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you know, like, no, like, totally. Yeah. Like they're very specific and they, they want it done fucking right. And there's like an intellectualism to BDSM that I think is so different than the regular, like cowgirl, reverse cowgirl, doggy style, missionary, like That's gonzo in a white room and like, yeah, come on her face. You know what I mean? I totally do. And I, I think that I think about, like, BDSM to sex as sort of, like, I don't know, Dungeons and Dragons to, like, a video game. Like, they're just, it's so much more cerebral. It's so much more Mm -hmm. um, protocols and rules. And in your it's very, you know, it's in your head. It's very much about fantasy to a degree that, to the nth degree past just vanilla sex. Right. That said, I think there are a lot of folks who who find that kind of sex exciting and want to watch it, but don't necessarily want to collar anyone or go to a munch or do this all in their real life. Like go to a what? Oh, a munch. What's so if, munch? if you're kind of Is new a, a to the BDS, it's you- kind of, it's, it's a dinner usually actually, uh-huh. but folks come and they actually meet people in the BDSM community. Maybe they're new or maybe, mm-hmm. you know, they've been in for a while. So you get to meet people in a restaurant where it's safe and you, get to know the community before you start trying to, you know, beat anyone with anything. <laughs> you know. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Munch. I love that. Sorry, I interrupted totally. you. What were you talking about? Oh, so I think that, yes, people who are kind of lifestylers or super, super, super into BDSM, I don't know, they're not so different from the rest of us. Although, you know, I think we're all nerds. I think it's a nerdy kind of thing and, and I say that with a lot of pride as a nerd yeah but also I think that there are things about power exchange that are sexy no matter where you kind of fall in your personal sex life right right I just mean I guess what I mean is you know your audience is comprised of people who are looking for a specific Pretty specific things. Often. Like, they're not somebody who is just going to jump on Pornhub and watch whatever, like, big-titted stepmom MILF scene is there for the day. You know what I mean? And not really care. Like, they they have... Yes and no. Like, more... I don't know, more like cultured taste. I don't know why. I'm imagining <laughs> that they have a monocle. Like, oh God, like, they have their yeah. I, I need it, a very specific kind of cake. It depends on the day. Yeah. Like, a lot of people... You know, maybe they have a BDSM scene half the time and just, like, regular old vanilla sex half the time. And I think that it's probably their porn consumption patterns, too. Mm. Like, the thing that you're into, maybe you're not into it every single day. Right. Or maybe it evolves. So maybe they're jumping on Pornhub occasionally, but they know that if they come to kink, they can get the thing that they right. want. Yeah, because it is a pretty specific thing. And, yeah. and I feel like there's a lot of thought and care put into all of the scenes. It's not a haphazard throw-together Kind of. No, we can't just like run a hotel room and yeah, exactly. book performers last minute. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, we actually have to work specifically with performers who want to do this and enjoy it. Right. And, you know, a lot of people don't. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I suppose there are people who are willing to get tied up for pay, but we actually just really don't like working with those folks because we want to have an authentic scene. Mm. That's what's actually hot. Mm-hmm. So we just don't work with those people. 
Right. So do you find that you end up hiring the same people quite a bit? Yeah. I mean, there's pros and cons to that. I think mm-hmm. that, you know, certainly there are people that people are like, oh, this person again. Mm-hmm. But also those people tend to have amazing scenes because right. they're super into what they're doing. Right. And so most of our, our members are actually really thrilled by the folks who they they know are really into it. Mm-hmm. Still to this day, Isis Love is one of the top performers on our site, the most interest people have. And frankly, she was retired for years and years, but her scenes are so freaking good. Yeah. That doesn't doesn't Yeah, I was going to say, I shot her like years ago for Brazzers, and I think she reti- had retired then or came back for a scene. or that, I mean, it was like at the end of her. Yeah. She was like done. Uh-huh. Wow. She just came back recently for a single scene. So that's super exciting. With you guys? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. But for years in between, mm-hmm. there was no ISIS content. But right. people just, I think that the BDSM folks maybe appreciate a little bit more, like, the folks who they know are, are super into what they're doing. Yeah. There's something very enjoyable about watching somebody enjoy what they're doing. The fans can tell when you're yes. doing something for a paycheck. I, I have noticed that. You know, the most popular girls are generally the ones who really love their jobs. And, you know, for you and I who see them offset, like, we know who really loves their job and who's <laughs> yeah. there for a paycheck. Like, we know that. And I feel yeah. like the fans can can feel that a lot of the time. And who wants to watch porn where someone looks bored? Yeah. I mean, maybe someone does. Somebody Perhaps probably, that's even a fetish. Somebody probably <laughs> does, yeah. But it's not my deal, and I don't think it's most people's. Yeah, I agree. I've heard a lot of girls talk about how they will have their first experiences with BDSM or try out things with you guys because they trust you as a company. Yeah. One person that comes to mind, and she told this story on my podcast, so if you guys go back and listen to the episode, you can hear it in detail, is Danny Daniels. And she did uh, the training of O, mm-hmm. I believe, with you guys. And she was deathly afraid of caning. I think was so. It? Or it was electricity. Now I can't remember. Uh, Let's call it caning. I think it was caning caning, to the point where she said if somebody brought a cane out, she'd kind of start to hyperventilate. I mean, they're pretty nasty. I've been caned once and I did not enjoy it. Yeah. (laughs) Not never again. Uh, And I believe Ramon was her scene partner. And there was a way that it was over, I think, a few day period Mm -hmm. where you guys took her through a sequence of events where she. It was like almost like Pavlov yeah. training, you yeah. know. She began to associate caning with pleasure mm-hmm. rather than the opposite, and it completely overcame her fear of caning. And it was so interesting to me how, you know, a, a kinky experience could psychologically change somebody in a way, in a positive way. Yeah, it's it's not even uncommon for people to especially in people who are are in the scene, Mm -hmm. to use BDSM to kind of work out trauma. Yes. And I I think it's incredible. You know, I really hope that they're doing all of the work they need to do outside of Mm -hmm. BDSM scenes. It's not in any way, you know, a A substitute for therapy. therapy. (laughs) Yeah, yes, this is true. (laughs) And it's it's just really amazing to me the healing power it can have. Mm -hmm. And just how hot something can become that maybe it wasn't before or mm-hmm. isn't the first thing you think of when you think of sex. Mm-hmm. It's it's fascinating. Yeah. That's one of the things I really love about working in this industry. You know, sexuality is such a powerful force. And I think it's something that we still don't really understand all that much. No. I you mean, know, it's so multifaceted and different for everybody and everyone has a different experience. And it is true that people can really work out certain traumas and and everything through sex, which is not something that most people think one would do. I think, you know, a lot of people have this misconception that sex is dirty and sex is always damaging. So the idea that it right. could be healing in some way, I think, is a foreign concept to a lot of people. Oh, especially for women. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, you know, Think about how much we can even study sex. Mm-hmm. It's in- 
incredibly difficult to get a grant or any kind of funding to do any research on sexuality. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that, but you're right. So we're in the dark. Yeah. We're kind of all just figuring it out. Yeah. You brought up women. Um, Did the Fifty Shades of Grey novel change anything? Did you notice any shifts in the kink community and BDSM with that? Because I was talking to somebody about this, and we were talking about how women have become more open about their sexuality and have become more open to watching porn and maybe admitting that they watch porn and enjoying porn and trying porn. And somebody brought up the Fifty Shades of Grey as a catalyst for that, which I had never thought about before. And and then I thought about it. I was like, yeah, actually, that could be true. Did you see anything like that? It's a really interesting phenomenon for us because Fifty Shades is, I have to say, not a good example of BDSM. Yes, every, <laughs> everybody in the BDSM community, that's the first thing that they say. So can you explain to those who maybe don't understand what you mean, what you mean by that? I'm going to be honest. I have not read the books. My understanding, however. I have read them. Okay, great. So would you say that all of the acts that took place were consensual? There wasn't much communication. So not negotiated, not... No. Right. No. It was very much a princess being, or a, a, a common girl being rescued by a prince and kind of being shown a different world that she immediately accepted without question. And Gotcha. You know, there wasn't... Yeah. So yeah. as a fantasy, great. Right. Cool. Um, that said... People who are into BDSM largely did not care for those books, is my understanding. Yeah. And that was part of it. But people who have made it to kink.com and who tend to be like our core members did not appreciate those novels. That said, we've always had a a much higher proportion of female members than I think most websites. Interesting. And certainly anywhere I'd worked. And we get a fair amount of couples who watch our content together. Why do you think that is? Um, I think that understanding yourself as having a BDSM-oriented sexuality kind of requires a lot of self-discovery and and knowing yourself Mm -hmm. and being a lot more comfortable with sex than if you didn't have to go that far and kind of work through that much to to get there. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's not it's not as simple. It's not as easy to ignore. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't get to kind of blindly stumble. I mean, I guess you could, but it's not ideal to blindly stumble <laughs> into a BDSM scene or relationship right. or situation. Right. Do you think that because well, I think that one of the sexiest things about BDSM and I guess this exists, you know, kind of in in all sex acts, and I guess just really in everything, is power dynamics between men and women or men and men and women and men. Like, um, and, I, and I wonder if women, I know for me, I was attracted to that, I think, because of the rigid power dynamics that, I don't know, we've been taught as women yeah. from an early age. And so the idea of exploring that, either giving into that idea of being, I'm submissive as a woman, or flipping it and doing the other side was very interesting to me. Like I remember, so I remember actually my first, my first inkling that I was kind of into this was when I was playing, I think like Cowboys and Indians or something with my <laughs> friends. That is actually when, how Peter figured it out too. Really? I like seeing like the girls tied up. Yes. <laughs> Yes. yes. So it was for me, um, and I got captured, <laughs> and I got tied up, and I got taken to jail. And I remember being excited about that. And then they very quickly untied me and took me out of jail, and I was very <laughs> upset about that. I was like, no, I need to be in jail longer. You need to put me back in there because I have, I am still going to rob you. <laughs> I'm trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember having this excited feel and not understanding it. Yeah. And then late, later on starting to to get that. But that was that that first moment. That little inkling. That's yeah. so funny. Yeah. You know, I think that it's sexy. 
I think for a lot of people, because it's actually very considered. Mm. So instead of kind of going along with whatever the power dynamics are in your life with whomever there with, your boss, the person sitting next to you on the bus, your partner, Mm -hmm. you are very, you're considering what you want the power dynamics to be, if you want them to shift, if you want to give them to give the power to someone else or take it from someone else. And I think just really thinking through and negotiating that is not a thing people do very often. Mm. And it's sort of exciting to like say, you know what, I want to be the powerful one right now. Mm-hmm. Or I am tired of this power. I just I want to serve someone. I want to do what someone else wants me to do. Yeah. And I'm very thoughtfully going into that. Yeah. I wonder if on some like deeper level it makes us kind of consider our place in the world. You know, because we are social creatures with a pecking order and a hierarchy. And Oh, totally. And BDSM allows you to kind of choose where where you are in that order. You don't have to like I mean, you have to earn it in the sense that, like, if you want to be a dom, you need to know what you're doing. You need to know yeah. how to hit p- people properly. All that kind of stuff is important. But, you know, you don't have to, like, earn it through climbing some social ladder sure. or kissing someone's ass or, you know what I mean? Having like, advantages in life. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, we don't often get to change our social standing or the power we have right. in life. But even thinking about power as something that is inherent in every interaction. Mm-hmm in every relationship is actually kind of, I don't know, it's really kind of shifts your perspective. Yeah. I think a lot of women, I know I've heard a lot that women feel weird about being submissive because they think that's like taking on a stereotypical role. Right. But it's what actually turns them on. So just having to think through that. Yeah. You know, it's, It's, yeah, I just, I love the fact that it requires so much thought and, like, Mm. really considering things that people just kind of ignore for the most part. Yeah. Day-to-day life, especially around sex. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely considered a lot why I prefer to be submissive in bed, and it has to do exactly with what you touched on earlier. Like, I am in control a lot of the times in my life. Like, I run my own business. I have people work for me. I'm constantly giving people direction. I'm constantly having to make decisions. I'm, you know, having to, you know— give people tasks. Like, when it comes to sex, like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm fucking tired. Like, somebody else make those decisions for me. Like, please, I don't want to do that. Like, there's something very freeing about being able to let go. Yeah, and just being someone that you're not or having mm-hmm. having the fantasy or living the fantasy that you're, you know, different from the way you are. Right, Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about uh, kink-specific policies on producing ethical porn. Um, I know you do, like, kind of before and after interviews and what that came out of and uh, so much more. So stick around. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast, too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. So 
I mentioned before that I have a lot of models on the show, and they talk about how kink has just been, kink.com has been a really wonderful place for them to explore different fetishes and how they always feel so safe and so well-respected there and so well-treated. And this is one of the things that I love to talk about because I know a lot of people that don't really understand the BDSM community, don't know a lot about porn. They see those extreme scenes on kink.com and they think, oh my gosh, these poor people are being abused. They don't want anything to do with this. Look, how sad they are. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I feel like there wasn't there some, I don't remember who it was. There was some woman who had some kind of big following and she mentioned like the number three video on porn, one of the top videos on Pornhub. And it was a girl being tied down and electrocuted. And she talked about like, this is what's wrong with porn. Like these poor girls being, you know, violently. (laughs) As though it was against her will. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Violently, um, you know, attacked and, and all, all these things that we know are not true. So how do you handle like, so how do you, how do you guys conduct business? Like, how do you, how does a typical day, um, on a kink set go? So I like to remind anyone who sees a video and goes, oh, that's real that, you know, Hollywood movies aren't real. Yeah. And you can do a lot of things that maybe look really scary, but you know, and maybe that maybe they hurt, maybe they don't, but you don't get to see behind the scenes in, in most Hollywood movies, unlike kink. Mm-hmm. So on a kink set, prior to being booked, a performer is going to fully understand exactly what they're expected to do, or they're going to be asked whether it is okay to do the things that we want to do. And that's everything from, is the scene partner okay? Do you want to perform, you know, whatever the particular fetish of the channel is? So are you fine with doing a pegging scene? Are you okay with, you know, cropping someone? How are you, you know? And we try to make it very clear, even the themes. So Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to show up on a scene and go, Wait, I'm not cool with this faux cess theme. Mm-hmm. I that's not okay with me. I never agree to that. And then be surprised because that's well, I just think unethical. Do you sorry, just quick question because I've found that I myself have run into this problem. Yeah. Do you insist on talking to the girl directly or do you go through their agent if they have an agent? And have you ever encountered a situation where the agent just has not communicated the situation to the girl and they've shown up on set and we're told something <laughs> different? And we're surprised because their agent sucks. I think, sadly, that happens more than any of us would like. Yeah. And the folks who who produce for us now, they used to actually be in-house with us. They were kink employees. Now they have their own studios, and they're making content the way that they want to do it. But – and. Some agents won't let you talk to the performers yourself. Yeah, I think we all know who we're talking about. Yeah. (laughs) And so if you want to work with those folks, you do your best. And you hope that the agent's passing along all of that information. Mm -hmm. But let's say that happens. Someone shows up and they're like, I don't want to ever do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there something in this wheelhouse that we can do that actually you would enjoy? Or should we just kill it? Mm Because either way, it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. We're happy to make adjustments. Every one of our directors, they have worked for us for years and years, and they know that the kink ethos is you don't push people to do things they don't want to do. If you have to kill a scene, you have to kill a scene. If you have to change up what you're doing, that's what you do. That's just ingrained into every person who works or has worked with kink. Mm -hmm. So... Once they get there, the normal things, hair, makeup, wardrobe, whatever, they're going to go through and fill out a checklist. And it's going to tell us, or the director, what they're interested in doing, what they're not interested in doing. And there's also a section for comments, like, oh, I might, but... So, for example, I'm cool with nipple clamps, but only this kind and not that kind. I hate, you know, tasers, but I'm okay with the cattle pro I mean, whatever it is... So the checklist is a starting point. Then we sit and talk. The director talks to 
all of our performers on camera about their checklists. And that's really what a checklist, a consent checklist should be. It's not for covering your ass. It's for initiating a conversation because communication is fundamental, not just to BDSM, I think, to shooting good porn. Mm -hmm. Once we have that conversation, that's, I think, usually part of the intro interview. And the reason for that is that we want to make it clear not only so that, you know, Visa is not angry that we are shocking young women against their will. Right. But also make it clear to anybody who sees that video, like, A, this is something someone super wanted to do. And so even if, like, there's a tear coming down, it's, you know, maybe tough in that moment. But this was their choice. Mm -hmm. And this, however it's kind of manifesting visually, it's what they want to be doing mm -hmm. and ultimately very satisfying. And if anything, I think it it's not really about, you know, don't worry. They're not captive. It's, it's more just to... For me, I like seeing BDSM sexuality portrayed really authentically and positively. It's not just, yes, sir, no, ma'am. It's, you know... There's a negotiation between every dom and every sub. What do you feel like doing today? Do you want me to crop your feet or no? Like, I want to set a good example. Mm -hmm. And so as the shoot goes on, and I think before we even start, it's very, very, very explicitly explained. If you want this to stop at any moment, you can use your safe word. You can call red. You can just say, hey, stop. Unless we decide that, you know, stop is not part of the scene, so you say something right. else. If you have a gag in, drop this piece of wood mm -hmm. or blink however many times. If you just need, I love, I don't know if you've ever interviewed JP the Pope, but watching him kind of do his intro, if you need me to scratch your nose, we can stop shooting. Like, whatever it is, your comfort is key. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like you have to do anything ever. Because you don't. There's always something else we can do. Yeah. So that's kind of how it starts. And then it's kind of up to them where they want to go. Right. Then at the end, we, we do the exit interview. I don't know that we were the first, but we certainly have been doing it for an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. And while I don't know that everybody else who does it is doing it for the right reasons anymore, mm. for us, it really is about, okay, how was that? What was good and what was bad? What would you not want to do again? Mm -hmm. Would you learn about yourself? Would you want to do this with us ever again? If not, cool. We'll still be friends. We'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll wave at you at ABN. Do you ever have people say in the exit interview that they, they didn't enjoy the experience oh, yeah. and, they, and they didn't like it? And then what do you do? Do you still publish that video? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's important to show reality. Mm -hmm. One of... One of the most memorable experiences I've had was I was at a convention and a, a young woman runs up to me and says, hey, I shot once for kink.com and I hated it. And the way you guys handled that, like I couldn't even finish the scene and you guys were so amazing to me. Like you paid me, you know, a prorated rate and no one made me feel bad. And it was just so great. I'm like, wow, for someone who <laughs> hated what we were doing, what an amazing thing. Yeah. And that's how... We want everyone to feel. Yeah. Because we really actually do care. Yeah. I think, you know, and, and as I mentioned, you guys have come up, and I think you've come up so much more now because the idea of consent and boundaries has become an issue that's come up so much in the past year. And there's been a lot of instances where directors have not respected performers' boundaries Performers have been made to do things that they didn't enjoy. Yeah. There wasn't communication on set about what the person was okay and wasn't okay with. And so now some companies are actually only now just instituting checklists, which I think you guys have had forever. It's, like well, you got you were like the OG <laughs> like consent boundary checklist people, and now the rest of us are kind of catching up on that. And even for me. You know, as a female producer who doesn't, who does, shoots pretty vanilla stuff for the most part, I am now so much more hyper aware of boundaries in communication 
something that I wasn't before. And I've never had anybody say that they had a bad experience with me or was made to do something that they didn't want to do, to my knowledge, obviously. Um, But I never really, like, sat down and was like, okay, let's have you guys talk to each other about their do's and your don'ts. Because I guess for me, I always figured, like, well, we're not shooting anything that extreme anyways, and I'm a woman. And so, like, and I always try to make the models feel comfortable and feel like they have power and they have say on set. So, like, they should know that they can call cut whenever they want, right? And me as a woman, I should be able to tell if somebody's uncomfortable. Like, I have that intuition. And And they'll be comfortable with you. And they'll be fine. Exactly. And and after all of these stories came up, it, it made me realize, like, that's not enough. It's actually really not enough. And it is really important that I make sure that the performers talk to each other about boundaries because sometimes it's not even something that's extreme, but it could be something that could trigger somebody because of something that happened to them in their past that obviously there's no way I could be aware of that. Oh, totally. And as upsetting as it is that there are all of these consent violations coming out, it's so... It's so positive that they're finally being talked about. Right. Because they were obviously happening. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, growing out of BDSM tradition, we, consent is a very negotiated, very, I mean, BDSM is successful when there's good communication. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's given everyone pause to go, okay, I bet there are things that I hadn't even thought of that someone might not know or right. just question assumptions. And I, it's really amazing to hear that folks like you and, you know, other folks who are shooting vanilla stuff are not just learning from what's happened, but just kind of who always had everyone's best interest at heart now have a new, you know, way to do that opened up to them and they're pursuing it. Yeah. So, yeah. Kudos to you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm pretty proud of myself. myself. <laughs> All you're doing good. I'm just <laughs> so one one thing I want to ask you is one of the something that people in the BDSM community always say, and this is a phrase that I think is confusing to a lot of people, is in a BDSM relationship, the sub always has the power. Can you explain that? What does that mean? So while on surface and in many ways, you know, the dominant is controlling the scene. And if you were to look and see someone serving someone else, you would say that they weren't in control. Everything that happens in a scene is dictated by the submissive. They are sharing what they will do, what they won't do. And maybe that's a a giant menu of things. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if a sub really doesn't want to do something, that's not going to happen in a consensual negotiation. So when we outline ahead of time and communicate about where our boundaries are, then we can stay within them and the dom can can work within that entire realm without doing anything the sub actually isn't comfortable with and doesn't consent right. to. Right, And then the sub doesn't have to, in the middle of the exchange, be like, ah, I don't like that. Yeah. You know, because it's been talked about beforehand, and then you can be in a, a safe place to freely explore whatever kinks you are, knowing that, like, And they can always the pull boundaries. the ripcord. Yeah. You can always use the safe word. And that is, you know, everybody should have a safe word, whether you're a dom or a sub mm-hmm. or something else. Mm-hmm. But... They're respected. That is inviolable. Always. So what is the importance of having a safe word versus just saying stop? You know, it might be sexy to have a scene where you say, no, no, stop. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. And the person keeps going. Mm -hmm. And if you say ahead of time, this is what I want. Don't listen when I say stop. Listen when I say pineapple Mm -hmm. or red. Um, Because those are not words that would normally come up during a sex scene. (laughs) Like, oh, rub me with your pineapple. <laughs> that pineapple in my mouth. <laughs> Not very commonly. Right. And so it will it lets you and it have that fantasy. You, yeah, and then also I guess that word is so such a contrast to the other words that are being said totally. in the exchange that it just it. pulls you out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you're right, pulls you out of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, because pineapple is like a couple few syllables. Yeah, you really have to yeah. want to say pineapple. Yeah, it's not a word that just rolls off the tongue <laughs> no, naturally. No, no. But I mean, saying no or keep to continue going when someone says no, that's a very valid and sexy fantasy. Right. So pick a different word. Right, right. What has some of your most popular kinds of scenes on kink.com? Um, the kids love the faux cest, man. I <laughs> We can't get away from that. <laughs> Even on King.com. <laughs> God, I thought you guys like oh, yeah. you were free of the faux cest. You know, one of our best and and most popular uh, channels is Families Tide. Uh, that's clever. Yeah, it's pretty I good. See what you did there? It's pretty good. Um, which which is, I mean, super sexy and super hot. You know, the most popular content tends to be a male dom with a female sub, mm-hmm. whether it's you know, sex and submission, which is, you know, boy, girl, P and B, mm-hmm. or hog tie and device bondage, which are a male handler, which is someone who isn't having sex with the sub, but mm-hmm. kind of acting on them. Mm-hmm. Maybe with a dildo or a taser or mm-hmm. whatever it is, but they're not participating as a themselves. Mm-hmm. So those are super, super popular. Um, I think that even though we have a high, you know, female and couple audience, I don't know that it's any different totally from, you know, any other porn. You mm-hmm. want to kind of see yourself reflected or a fantasy you like. Mm-hmm. That's where a lot of people are. Like, hey, that looks like hot sex. Yeah. Do you guys have those blowjob machines? The ones where you strap the girl's head to the thing and then it— like, Oh, no, we don't do it. Oh, those are— no, we uh, so we do have very strict rules, and anything that doesn't allow someone to pull back. Yeah, that's true. We don't let them do. Yeah, that's true. Could you have a button? But then, what if it malfunctions? Yeah, I like those scenes though. Yeah, I know. The first time I saw that, I was like, "Oh, that's fucking." Cool. We need to figure out a way to like fake it, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, you're now subject to this machine. Yeah. Uh, you guys did public humiliation, we used which to, was yeah. like a big thing, but you guys don't do that anymore. Now, I, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a, a scene where um, there would be like actual performers having sex and then other people would be invited to watch mm-hmm. and engage in some non-sexual way. Is that is that correct? Sometimes. Um, well, so the public, of course, was never allowed to do anything sexual necessarily, at least that could cause STIs. Yeah, so you nothing that you had to be tested for. Right. Um, but, you know, there was touching and maybe a couple slaps or a nipple right. pinch and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, and they were always controlled environments, like even though it looks like we're in a bodega that anyone could walk into. Mm-hmm. No, no one was really allowed to come in except right. for the people who were supposed to be there. Um, and a lot of those, especially for... Our gay site, Bound in Public, were shot in the armory, so it was kind of an invite-only situation, even when the public was involved. They Mm -hmm. were hand-selected. Right, right, right. And you guys don't do that anymore? We don't. You know, it's a really difficult thing to film. Mm -hmm. Um, And without, A, without an armory, (laughs) since we sold it, uh, you know, it's hard to kind of you need a lot of space for that. You do, and a lot of parking. So much, and and also <laughs> like there's only so many businesses who are cool with you know, <laughs> shooting porn there. Yeah. I feel like I see a news article every week now about like a library or a gas station where everyone's mad at them because yeah. some people shot some porn on their phone. Yeah, but I think also even the appearance of having the public involved. Apparently, lets people believe that we could possibly be doing that, and that's how we ended up in lawsuits. Mm. So ultimately, wasn't worth it. No, and and I'm I'm personally kind of sad about it because I think public disgrace was some of the hottest content we ever did. Yeah, but what can you do? Yeah. So speaking of the armory, yeah. So that is a place that. Peter owned mm-hmm. for a while and was the 
the homestead of kink. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the building, your sure. problems <laughs> with San Francisco, <laughs> oh, and you guys occupying that building, and then eventually yeah, selling yeah. it? So prior to 20, 2007, when Peter bought the building, it had been sitting mostly empty for decades. Every now and then, there would be someone who would rent it for a while. George Lucas rented it for a little while for, I think, Return of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. And, like, the San Francisco Opera would rehearse there. What was it originally? It was a National Guard armory. Okay. That um, they built it there, at least— you know, the lore says that they built it there because there's an underground stream called the Mission Creek. They built it atop that and then left in the basement. If anyone has seen our scenes, you may have seen the water running through the actual basement. That was the Mission Creek. They left it open so that they would have their own natural water source mm -hmm. should things go poorly. Mm. Um, so it's a 200,000-ish square foot building. It was supposed to be replica or inspired by Moorish castles. Mm. And he purchased it in 2007, despite the fact that over the years, several people have tried server farms, condos. San Francisco is an interesting town. Um, there's a lot of nimbyism, the not in my backyard. We don't want developers. We don't want these condos. We don't want the server farm. For whatever reason, they didn't block the sale to a pornographer. But, the, but then once they figured it out. I was going to say, they probably didn't know. Yeah, they I picketed like. it for a They picketed it for a while. Before the sale. Um, it was right after. Oh, okay. So yeah. they probably literally didn't find out until after. Then they're like, oh, Must sh have been. shit. Yeah. Whoops. We let that one slip under the radar. Yeah. So, I mean, they carried signs for a little while, but ultimately you we were— invited them in for public disgrace That's scenes. the thing. We were such a good neighbor. <laughs> like, we cleaned up that building. That entire block was a mess. You know, we kept it clean and tidy. You know, we just tried to be a good neighbor as much as we could. We shot there for 10 years, and, I mean, in every nook and cranny. Because at the time, I mean, back then we were shooting— I got to say multiple scenes per day. I mean, twice, three times as much as we're shooting now. Mm -hmm. And after 10 years, eventually even 30 cinematic sets gets a little bit old. Yeah. So in 2017, Peter got an offer that he couldn't refuse, sold the armory. And we actually, and he sold, or he bought a new office building, new, a different office building mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just down the road. Same street, different block, and our much smaller team is housed there now. Mm -hmm. But when Peter owned it, I mean, it was, I don't even think I understood, even though I had worked there seven years or so, I don't think I really understood what it meant to the entire community, especially inside of our industry. Mm -hmm. Models met each other. There were there was opportunity for instruction. People were able to learn how to dom because they were hanging out on other sets that mm -hmm. people were shooting on. Could You guys could house models there too, right? Oh, yeah. We had dorms. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we would regularly have someone come up for several days, shoot for a couple of different sites, hang out. I mean, they would sleep there. I think it was, it was really a, a special place. Mm -hmm especially for performers and filmmakers. I mean, a lot of people learned how to do this by starting as a PA at Kink and then working up to the next thing, and right. there was a lot of opportunity. So that era is gone. It's over, but it was really special. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that place is iconic. And the fact that you guys occupied such a huge space for such a long time... It was incredible. I mean, fuck, dude, I tried to have a studio that lasted like two years. It's hard. And it was 3,000 square feet. Oh, yeah. You know? And this building was really just trying to crumble, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, the entire time. It was such a money pit. Like, I bet. Placing entire turrets. Yeah. You know, just the constant construction it became a pain. Yeah. Who bought it? I believe a real estate investment company out of somewhere in the Midwest or South or something. And is it 
it is still empty. Ugh. They painted it white, knocked down all the walls and the sets, and they've been unable to rent it out. Does that kind of break your heart a little bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to see, especially we still have the bar across the street, the Armory Club. So go down and look over. It's a little nostalgic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. So you um, are here because you are actually going to be attending some uh, board meetings for FSC and Pineapple Support, uh, two organizations that you are a part of. Yeah. We've talked about this before on this podcast, but just for those of who may be listening for the first time, can you explain what the FSC is and what Pineapple Support is? Oh, sure. And maybe what you do on the board? Yeah, so FSC is for, for Free Speech Coalition, and it's essentially the trade organization of the adult industry. Um, it has largely been there when we've had to fight battles, essentially, against mostly the government. Mm -hmm. um, and it, when we're not fighting the government, we're really just trying to make the industry a better place and help support the businesses that are in it however we can. Mm -hmm. Pineapple support offers free, entirely free, counseling to anyone in the adult industry, but is specifically meant for performers, and basically grew out of the suicides in 2017. And someone finally said, we need to do something and did it, and that was Leah Tannett. So uh, both organizations, I'm a member of the board. Um, I don't, uh, let's call it a dozen board members on each. Mm -hmm. So as part of that group, it's a lot of um, kind of trying to set the high level, you know, strategy and fundraise, get more people involved, get the word out. I think it's really important to give back to the adult industry. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit of a rogue magnet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And everybody's very much kind of like on their own little planet with their own little independent content creations thing going on. And they don't really think about it's hard for us to see ourselves as a collective group sometimes. Oh, yeah. You know, even when we're all kind of joining together to fight something, it's a bit of yeah. cat herding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's an industry that attracts people who are comfortable and prefer not to do the mainstream, I don't know, accepted stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't need societal approval. And generally speaking, those people don't necessarily want anybody else's approval or want to work together. Right, 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 right. So um, I really, I personally have devoted my entire adult life to the adult business. And I feel like what Free Speech Coalition is doing from continuing to fight the 2257 lawsuit <laughs> to things that, you know, in recent past, Prop 60, and things that are happening now. I was going to say, we have a new bill. We do. Yay! Lucky us. Yay! <laughs> do you want to talk a little bit about the new bill? Well, we are certainly trying to help businesses through AB5, but, of course, as we've heard recently, one of the, or I guess she was the sponsor of AB5, co-sponsored a new bill, what is it, AB22? Three bunch of numbers. Fifty something. A, a B a bunch of numbers. Uh, hopefully A B goes away. But essentially, um, it appears that the parent union of the Adult Performers Actors Guild, without APAG's knowledge or approval, sent a bill to oh, what is her name? Christina, it's an assembly, congresswoman. Right? Yeah, an assembly member who seemingly didn't understand the, the ramifications and just decided to introduce it with the, the person who did AB5. And it caused a giant uproar. And I honestly don't, everyone now has apologized except for the woman who introduced it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where it's going, but did we're- did one person withdraw their support? Yeah, yeah, Gonzalez withdrew because I mean, my guess is she's like, oh, I have enough 
problems. I yeah, I don't need to deal make with everybody shit. angry. <laughs> so essentially, from what I understand, it is going to it's trying to force performers to have to get like a license and to register in order to perform in scenes, in order to cam. Do anything. Anything sex-related whatsoever. Stripper, everybody. Yeah. And I think the things that are most disturbing are that it involves live scanning. So they take their fingerprints and store them in a database. So now we have a database of everybody who, yeah, does sex work. I don't trust the government with that. No. I mean, it's especially terrifying after it's been revealed that Airbnb is using this new technology to recognize sex workers and ban them from their platforms. And then on top of this, there are these training requirements that are, frankly, kind of insulting, especially the language in the bill and the language that's been used about how lawless this industry is and no one's paying taxes and everyone's sexually harassing. So we have to you know, make them do these, these training sessions at their own expense <laughs> every two years in order to get the privilege of this license. It's yeah. ridiculous. I have to tell you, so I had to take a sexual training harassment course for Wicked. Sure. And it, <laughs> Hey, we've got him too. <laughs> and the thing is, is that I understand, I understand why they did it. I, I, I understand the good intentions behind it. But the problem is, is that it's like a mass produced sexual har- training harassment course for like corporate offices so it really doesn't apply to our industry like one of the things was you don't bring porn to work <laughs> and show your co-workers yeah. and I was like uh okay so how do we handle that one another one was you don't tell your co-worker that like they should wear a shorter skirt well, what if I'm dressing somebody in wardrobe <laughs> to go on a set and I want them to wear? You know what I mean? Yeah, like totally. there was there was just a lot of things in there that like just didn't don't apply. Don't apply at all. And we so at Kink we've we're mandated as an employer in California to do sexual harassment training. Yeah, and, this is this is why I think it it was supposed to come into effect this year, but they actually pushed it. Oh, we've been to doing next it for year. years, but I don't know about this. I think I think I think the. It was supposed to go into effect this year. Like, because that's what it was. I believe it, it was if you had 15 or more employees, you had to do it. And then they changed it to if you have five or more employees. And because of AB5 forcing you to oh, make God, a lot yeah. of people now employees, it kind of changed things. But then I think they actually pushed that to next year, but Wicked got ahead of it anyways. So we had to do it. It's a smart thing to do. To do it. Yeah, totally. But it was just, I mean. It could also be absurd. The one year we did do like the, oh, it was, you know, an online thing. We have to watch the video of people. Hey, nice tits. Yeah. Coworker. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So (laughs) the way that we usually do it is uh, famed industry attorney, Karen Tynan, Mm -hmm. is our employment counsel. And she just comes in and actually leads the session. Mm -hmm. And tailors it to our right. our work. Yes. And of course everyone is like, so what if I have to tell someone? And she's like, well, yeah, obviously do your job. Yeah. As opposed to not really knowing what the right thing to do is. Right. So <laughs> that yeah. helps. Yeah. I, I could, th- I feel like that would be definitely a better direction. And I mean, you know, we all kind of, and here's the thing, like my crew and I have worked together for an incredibly long time, and I only hire people that know how to conduct themselves on set, and they understand that it's not okay to grow up models or to make inappropriate comments to them or to say, like, nice tits. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't care that Just we're on a that. porn set. Like, I can say that. You know what I mean? Like, if it's in the right context, like, God, you've, like, they take their time. Like, God, your breasts are great. Yes. Like, wow. You know what I mean? But not, but... Context matters. Context totally matters. <laughs> so, you know, for us, we were just kind of like, but I understand the the meaning behind it. And, and it actually is funny because some people really do need to be told that, you know? I feel like you and I, maybe as women, we're like, well, duh, obviously you can't do that because we as women understand <laughs> what's okay and what's not. Maybe that's not always true, but some people literally need to be told that they can't grope models or touch them well, or you know, whatever. The woman who introduced the new bill for the fingerprints and the training was censured last year for sexually harassing people 
and she was taken off all of her committees because she apparently was groping um, pages or aides. Oh, that's so hilarious. It's incredible. Yeah, that's yeah, incredible. And that, painful. wow. But that also does make me crazy. Women who think that just because they're a woman, they have license to grab a man because men like it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's no. like the same like sexist mentality that's going off on the other side. So. Sexism hurts all of us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just like just respect people, respect that's their it. boundaries, respect their bodies. Like don't touch people. Even like if I'm working with a model and I need to like adjust a bra strap, I kind of warn them. I'm like, hey, can I just can ask. I move this for you? Like, it's or so if I need easy. to. Like, I never, even if it's somebody that I know that's my friend that I've worked with for decades, I still don't, it's just a habit of mine, you know? It's it's common courtesy. That's what I feel like too, but some people just, they well, need to be. not so common, I suppose. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, they need that training exercise, so. It would be nice though to have it tailored for us. Yeah, we definitely, and I think so. one of the, the things that we're trying to work on with Free Speech Coalition is doing that, making yeah. the industry sexual harassment training that is actually relevant for right. yeah. us. Which is why people need to support the FSC, and they should go to fsc.org, correct? Freespeechcoalition.org. Free speech co- Does fsc.org not lead to Free Speech Coalition? I'm guessing we didn't jump on that three-letter domain, sadly. Mm, yeah, that probably is something else. Like- yeah. Okay, so freespeechcoalition.org, because I feel like I've said FSC before, just because I'm naturally oh, yeah. abbreviating it. But freespeechcoalition.org, go there. You guys can actually donate um, and support the industry, support and help us in endeavors like this, trying to kind of streamline the industry and, you know, make it a better working environment for everybody. So please consider that. It would mean a great deal to us and ensure our survival and our continued um Journey to becoming a better industry. <laughs> I would really appreciate it. <laughs> Allison, thank you so much for coming on. This was really great. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Can you let everybody know, I don't know if you're on social media. I couldn't find you. <laughs> I found kink, but I couldn't find you. But just go ahead and plug whatever you want to plug. I'm not a big social media person. Um, I do have an Instagram. Okay. At kink CEO. Okay. But otherwise, you can find me at Kink. At Kink on Twitter is just Kinks overall. Is it or Kink.com? I say it's Kink.com. I think it's Kink.com. We've had so many. Yeah. We've been banned on every platform multiple times. Oh, I'm times. sure. That reminds me. The other thing that you wanted to talk about, because speaking of being, ban- being shadow banned. banned and banned on public platforms, this new ticketing um, platform for adults. Coming this summer, yeah, we're launching Tixty.com, T-I-X-T-Y. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to make an Eventbrite for us. You know, we've ourselves had our workshops banned, shadow banned, hidden, delisted from platforms like Eventbrite. And I think it's kind of time for, I don't know, if you live in some city that isn't L.A. or San Francisco, Maybe you don't know, like, where to find sexy events in your area or Mm -hmm. workshops or what have you. We're building that out so that folks know where to get educated and have sexy fun come in the summer. Awesome. Sounds great. All right. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, As always, Facebook.com slash Holly Randall and filter to join my Facebook group. Actually, it's facebook.com slash groups slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. I also have facebook.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered, but that's just my general page, which I will admit I don't update nearly as much as my group. My group is like 700 members in it, and we all talk about things and relevant adult stuff, and it's uh, it's actually really fun. And then obviously, my Patreon, if you want to support this podcast and help me make this a better show um patreon.com slash holly randall and filtered you guys are awesome thank you so much see you next week